Just want to remind you where we've been over the last uh, few weeks. From Jeremiah 17, 9, we've drawn the conclusion that, uh, and I'm, I'm being a little presumptuous there, I'm assuming you're kind of seeing this too, that we don't know our own hearts. Uh, the human heart is desperately sick of all else who can know it. And then it goes on to say that the Lord, and the Lord is the one who knows and understands the human heart. And that's important because tonight when we get into Matthew, Jesus is going to begin to give us some principles and clues as to how we can see what God sees in our hearts. And uh, this again, I remind you, is to be turned inward. It's not about uh, trying to pass judgment on people around you. You can be observant of that uh, because sometimes what people speak is very revealing about things in the heart that they may not, may not even know that they're there. But if you, uh, if you don't love them with the love of Jesus, you have no business trying to bring any correction to them or to say anything to them about it. It is not your place because the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. And the reason Jesus could bring correction is because He earned the right to bring correction to people. I believe that if we would begin to operate by that principle, there'd be a lot less of the religiosity we're trying to feed on others. Um, second thing we saw is the, the conduct that compels us to lash out with condemnation of others is in our own heart. We got that out of Romans chapter 2. About us being guilty of the very thing that we spew condemnation on others for. And so the reason that it stirs us up and motivates us to want to um, to pass judgment on others is rooted right in this thing that it's lurking inside of us. Um, when, when God calls someone to minister correction, it's not going to be out of fleshly anger. It's going to be out of love of Jesus with a view to helping them come to repentance. And that's what, that's what the objective is. I uh, had an interesting experience this week. Uh, I got my fourth uh, jury summons. This time they actually were having the court case. <laughs> so usually the night before I'm like, well, am I going to go do this? Or i got to go over to the courthouse and do my civic duty. And So uh, I was over there along with about 70 other people um, in jury selection for a murder trial that's going on now. And fortunately, I did not uh, I didn't get selected. But I did tell Harold a key. If you want to be sure they won't call you, just put on there that you're a minister or a pastor. Or an ex-cop. Or an ex-cop. No, or an ex-cop. That's true. So, uh, <laughs> so through this whole process, <clears throat> you know, they, they selected 26 people, but the rest of us still had to stay. So finally at 2.30 in the afternoon after they had gone through 26 and they sent home 15 or 18 other people, they finally came out with the, uh, with the people that they selected to be their jury and they let us, they let us go. But sitting there, <clears throat> it was interesting, I was walking out with this lady I was sitting next to the whole day and, uh, and I said, well, it was nice sitting in silence next to you for the last eight hours. <laughs> she wanted to kick out that. So, uh, if she only knew. If she only knew. <laughs> yes, sir. I got There was a Mexican felt that was being tried. And I asked the judge if he was a, if he was a legal alien. <laughs> Illegal. No, I asked him. Oh, is he legal? Is he legal? They sent you out. Well, it was interesting sitting in the courtroom and having a lot of time to think. Um, while part of the time, you know, we, I had a book with me. I've been reading a little history about the Mountain View Hotel in Oracle. It was. Uh, built in uh, the late 1880s, and uh, apparently it was pretty fancy for the time. It's not all that large, but it cost them $90,000 to build it. But people came from all across the country to, to go there for their lungs and all. And so, but once you went into the courtroom, you couldn't have a book, you couldn't have anything with you. And so I, uh, I got to realize that we need to do a study about the different words for sin in the Bible. I started off and I could only think of three, and then finally fourth and fifth one came along. And uh, so I was having Bible study while I was sitting there. If only they had known, did they? Throw me right out. <laughs> Although they did mention God's name once because we did all have to 
Uh, I swear that we would tell the truth and the information we gave is true, so help us God. And I'm like, wow. <laughs> Get him out of here. <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it was uh, interesting to sit there and to think about uh, trials. You know, we were looking last week at trials. And uh, the fact that trials are an experiment <coughs> to check what's in our hearts. That's, that's one of the definitions of paraza, that word we looked at last week, the Greek word for trial. And thinking about trials, and then of course thinking about a legal trial at a court. So um, it was interesting uh, just observing. And, uh, you know, it's a tragic situation because uh, I don't, don't know my, I don't anything about the victim. They, of course, you know, they ask if any of us knew anything about the case, which there wasn't anybody there that said they did. And uh, it was actually a murder that happened in the prison, and the guy being tried is the cellmate of the fellow who was murdered. Um, so, no video coverage of it or anything like that. I, I uh, you know, I think about a, a family who's gone through the tragedy of the son being incarcerated, and then for him to be killed in prison. Um, there's a lot of heartache, a lot of bad circumstances out there, much of which people bring on themselves. Some have to do with circumstances, sometimes being in the wrong place at the wrong time. But you see, God sees and knows all of this, and guess what? He's the final judge yes. of all that conduct. Yes. And he will have the final say about all these things. The only thing I've been praying is that whatever actually happened will come out and that some semblance of justice can be done. So this thing about lashing out with condemnation of others. Uh, the one thing that I think a lot of people were relieved when the judge was given instructions when he said this is not a capital case. I don't know what the legal parameters are for that. He said the jury's decision is simply guilty or not guilty and there's no sentencing that will be done by the jury. The judge actually has a responsibility of sentencing in this kind of case. So uh, that gave a lot of people a, a sense of relief that were there. And most were just honestly, most had never been on a jury before. I've only been on one other. It was a horrible experience uh, because people were more interested in, in getting out before 4.30 than they were the future of the guy who was on trial. It was pretty disgusting. I couldn't win a single convert, <laughs> to my point of view. <laughs> I had people that agreed, but they still went over it. <laughs> so anyway, it looked like uh, people were pretty sober-minded about it, and that, and that, that was pretty good. Um, third thing, in the way of summary, Exodus tells us that the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. So that settles this issue, uh, at least among those of us who believe the Bible is God's Word. Because, you know, the experts, uh, intellectual experts and authorities about human behavior say that's not true. But the Bible says it's so. And so uh, they can uh, profess to be wise. But you know what the reality is? That those of us who've had kids have certainly seen visible evidence that uh, it is easier for kids to do what's wrong than it is uh, to do what's right. <laughs> Okay, let's get back where we were here. So uh, we're going to go to Matthew tonight, and we're going to start Matthew 8, and we're just going to, or, excuse me, Matthew 5, verse 8, and we're going to see some of what Jesus had to say about the heart. And uh, I think this can be more significant maybe than other times that you've perhaps read some of these verses because we've seen Jeremiah that tells us we don't know what's in our heart, so how do we... How do we learn what's in our heart? And that's what Jesus is speaking about here and some of His teaching. Matthew 5, <clears throat> you'll recognize this. It's called the Beatitudes. And uh, in Matthew 5, 1, it says, When He saw the multitudes, He went up on the mountain, and after He sat down, His disciples came to Him. Um, for those of you that uh, don't uh, join us on Sundays and uh, you go and worship other places and all of them, we had an extraordinary meeting with the Lord on Sunday. Uh, the most unusual, I would have to say, of the year and a half that I've been sharing over there. And one of the things the Lord told me I needed to do for Sunday was to sit down. And uh, so I sat down while I was sharing. And I, I've done that before. And I 
I've done that a lot in Bible conferences, but um, I was just talking about <clears throat> whether we want to be comfortable just hanging around talking about God or if we want to go and have a face-to-face -face encounter with Him. And um, the, the children of Israel decided as a whole that they were too frightened to get too close. Of course, you know, maybe if Sunday up at the front of the building, if the platform started shaking and there was smoke coming out, not from a machine, somebody was telling us about going to church where they have the, folk, uh, the, uh, the smoke cloud machine uh, out there to, you know, that way the, the super pastor can jump out of the clouds, I guess, or something. Yeah. Mark, could you work on that? You know, maybe you could get us a fog machine. <laughs> anyway, grill. <laughs> Uh, but the the uh, if there had been what they encountered, you know, there was there was earthquakes, there was thunder, there was lightning, and uh, they uh, the men said to Moses, "You go check with God. We're going to stay down here, and then whatever He says, you come tell us." They were afraid to go and get that close to God. And unfortunately, a lot of Christianity is about hanging around with people who talk about God and things about God. But there is never a concerted effort to urge people from their heart to turn to God and to actually seek His presence and seek His face. And uh, I really believe that's the place that God is calling His real body to. I think that's the place that He, that he wants us to be. Uh, you know this thing about lightning, I have to tell the story. Uh, some of our Michiganders uh, arrived this week and uh, Larry was telling us that They'd come in and they wanted to go out and surprise Dave and Pat Newby and go see them at the RV park. But of course, it's gated. And uh, <clears throat> so they, they called someone else that they knew and said, would you come let us in because we want to surprise Dave and Pat and showed up. And he said the storm was coming in and I, can't, I guess it must have been uh, either Sunday night or Monday whenever you guys got really hit with the storm. We, we had a super storm here last night. Was flowing over the gutters last night for us. And I looked over, I could see the sunshine in Queen Valley. <laughs> but of course, when it's raining there, sometimes the sunshine here. You know, that's monsoon here. But anyway, he's waiting at the gate, and the storm's moving in, and lightning strikes, and guess what? The gate opened, <laughs> and they drove right in. So we told them that was the Lord welcoming you guys back to Queen Valley. <laughs> story to remember. That goes right next to the one that happened in Coolidge and I don't know if you remember this Chuck, but on a Sunday night back in the 60's, my wife was visiting her grandmother over on Lindbergh Street close to the water tower where she lived for 50 years and lightning struck the Baptist church and it burned down. <laughs> and when you think about the quintessential thing of, you know, oh God, strike me with lightning. You know, that's pretty cool. Anyway, Larry and Cheryl got the gate open and they got to surprise Dave the Baptist. So praise the Lord for that. So here there's a crowd that's gathered together and he begins to teach them and he talks about how you're blessed, you're poor in spirit and and uh, there's a lot of things that we can investigate here, but I, I really want us to get specifically to verse 8 um, and not chase the other rabbits at the moment. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The pure in heart. So when you think about um, seeking the Lord and turning her whole heart to Him, there is an objective. There is a goal. You know, in religion, there are all these different goals depending on, on the church. In the, in the Church of Christ, I got to teach a Bible conference in a Church of Christ in, in uh, Colorado some years ago. In the Church of Christ, if someone comes to receive Jesus, they immediately take them back and baptize them. Great. I think that's terrific. And of course, there are some who believe that the physical act of going under and coming out completes their salvation. Uh, and uh, you have to choose what you're, what you're going to settle on for that. So that's the objective. Get people to come to Christ and get them baptized. In the Baptist church, if you can get them to pray the sinner's prayer. So that's the idea is get them to come forward and to publicly confess Jesus. Uh, you know, in the Catholic church, you have a whole lot of steps along the way. You start off with the christening and then, you know, you uh, have the sacraments that you need to go through. So there's that objective. 
But the Lord actually does have an objective for us, which, by the way, is not the same as any of those. You can talk about the Pentecostals, uh, the hardline Pentecostals trying to get people to speak in tongues. You've got, uh, you, you've got the, the Presbyterians that want everybody to just be nice and quiet. And, uh, uh, and then you've got the little... <laughs> I thought you might enjoy that. <laughs> you got the you got the you got the, the Lutherans that you know thank God for the baptism that happened uh, back when you were a baby and then you got confirmed. Oh, yeah, you got all of these this plethora of things that that people are trying to get you to do. Uh, some churches where you have to sign all of your personal assets over to the church to be a part of you know there's everything imaginable out there. But the Lord has an objective about our heart, <clears throat> and Jesus just told us one of those. Now, we can say, all right, the pure in heart is the objective. What does that mean? Well, that's the $64,000 question. Isn't it? <laughs> what does it mean to have a pure heart? To be a woman like Jesus. What's that? To be like Jesus. No, to we know faith. that. We know that. To have faith. Having faith. Faith is definitely an element that is essential because without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those who come to Him must believe that He is and that is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good one right there. Broken and contrite heart. A broken and contrite heart. We know that God's opposed to the proud. See, we can begin to collect a lot of these scriptures that we know, some that we sing as songs, others that maybe you memorized years ago or they just have been important enough in your life that they pop right into your head. But the objective is the pure heart. And the issue then becomes, how do we get to that place? Well, let's look at a few other things Jesus says about the heart. If you go to Matthew chapter 6 now, Matthew chapter 6, we're going to see a few more things that he, that he had to say there about the heart and about moving us toward this place of having a pure heart. We, we know, you know, thinking about the pure heart, Jesus said, if you believe in me, so then that gets back to the faith thing. If you have faith in me, you believe in me. Jesus says, here's the evidence. The works that I do, you're going to do. <laughs> Now really, just think about it. I'm not actually to you raise your hands, but how many times in a church meeting you've ever heard a pastor say that if you have faith, you're going to do the things Jesus did? <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> you know, there's some other things that go in with that. I mean, you know, that none of these things in and of themselves gives you the whole picture. Because we know we have to love the truth. We, we can't walk with God if we don't love the truth. And if you don't receive the love of the truth, Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2 says God gives you over to a deceiving spirit so that you'll believe what's false. God will do that to you because of a problem in your heart. That's scary. That should stir up and engender a fear of God in people, but it's amazing how that gets skipped over so often. And, uh, and certainly in public gatherings and preaching and teaching. Because that's a little bit hard. Let's, let's just get them into the baptistry. Let's just get them to pray the prayer. Let's just get them to speak in tongues. So let's just get them to, to make a huge donation uh, in our, our, uh, give all of their worldly resources to us or something. So in chapter 6, he gives us a little more information and insight about this. In verse 19, Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust... Has anybody noticed the infestation of moths lately? In our house. Oh my goodness. I know every time I buy fuel, I've got 15 or 20 of them on my windshield. Splat. They don't make very good decorations on there. And then I look at my, my wife's car and I need to you know get a toothpick and pick them out of the grill and out of the teeth and everything like that. Um, well, by the way, it's really been funny the last couple of uh, trips we've been to Casa Grande. Uh, we were talking the other day with some folks about migrations of insects. I remember driving across the King Ranch when I grew up in the part of Texas that's now a lake down there. Uh, and, and it was 100 miles with nothing. And it was all through the middle of the King Ranch. And there were always migrations of tarantulas, and then sometimes there were migrations of different kinds of butterflies and different insects, crickets, different things. 
But between here and Casa Grande, as you go over, uh, what do they call that, the Girl Scout Mountains, and uh, you, you go, the, the 387 is kind of the shortcut off of the 87, right, you come out right by Interstate 10. There's been a migration of yellow caterpillars. <laughs> and there's so many of them you can't miss them. And don't step on your brakes because it's a little yeah. slimy up there. But it's really strange that it's in just for maybe, it, it only lasts for about a half a mile. But there's this massive. And what's crazy is these caterpillars are confused. Because some of them are going to the north and some are going to the south. Normally the tarantulas are all going in one direction. You know, or the butterflies are. Anyway, um, moths, watch out for them. I had one come visit me last evening. It's a little bit annoying when you're trying to go to sleep and moths trying to find a place to lay an egg or take a bite. <laughs> What's that? For the fan, get some of Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> Verse 19, don't lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust destroy. And where thieves break in and steal. Well, tonight's a phone night. <laughs> Man, that's, that must be your, that wasn't your phone. No. It's the same ring. Okay, I turned that right now. Oh, did you? <laughs> that's all right. Just put it on speaker and we'll all say hi. <laughs> Would you like a subscription to the Arizona Republic? Yeah. I can answer that one for you. Well, actually, I probably should know. <laughs> I don't say no to them anymore. Propaganda mill? Hell no! That's what I tell them. That's what I tell them. I don't want to pay for your propaganda. <clears throat> anyway, that's another story. Where thieves also can break in and steal. Don't lay up treasures there. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So there is a connection between that upon which we set our heart's desire. And where our attention is going to be focused. Our heart helps to guide our focus of attention. You know that there are more things to do even around where you live than you have enough years to get them all done. You realize that? I remember one night, a friend of ours in our church in Colorado, his wife was having a blood pressure issue. And uh, her blood pressure was 260 over 160. And we're 100 miles from the hospital because we're out in the middle of nowhere. And so we're like, two of us are going to drive him and his wife to the hospital. But 100, well, it was actually 120 miles to the hospital. <clears throat> and my co-pilot was actually a guy who drove the ambulance. He said, we can really just get there faster if we'll just jump in the car and go. And he has a couple of things that he needs to take back to the store in Grand Junction that's 100 miles away. So she's in the car and, and he's going, and I looked at him and I said, Dave, your wife needs to get the hospital now. That stuff can wait. And by the way, if she dies, how much will it matter whether you got that thing fixed right then or not? So we get to the hospital and they're all like lackadaisical and everything. And we're like, she is having a serious problem. Her blood pressure is through the roof. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay, you know. And they get the cuff on and they go, oh my goodness. And then they rush her off to, by the way, she lived. But it was, a, it was interesting how you can let your focus be on these things that... Really, how much in the scope of things, how much do they matter? You know? So we want to focus, well, by the way, after disparaging about cleanliness is next to godliness and uh, Sunday, and uh, waste not, want not, I'm not 
I'm not encouraging you to become slothful, okay? <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> Being clean is a good thing. I believe that Jesus took baths, okay? There's no place in the Bible that said that He did other than when He was baptized by John the Baptist. But I believe Jesus took baths, okay? But you can give your heart over to and be obsessed by some things that are simply not really the priority. And if you want to know what those priorities should be, don't ask me. Okay? Jesus is your Lord. I'm dealing with what needs to be the priority for me. And mine keep getting shifted. I was sure I was going to hear on Sunday night. Jurors are dismissed. Sunday night, be there at 8.15. Plan to be here all day. Like, okay, the broken down vehicle over here and that one over there. Those things will just have to wait. You see, things are always calling to us, folks. So we have to have some discernment about what really deserves our attention. So we want our treasure to be laid up in the heavenly things. So what does that mean? Well, you know, what that does mean is that you need to have your relationship right with your fellow man. Because the Bible says, if you don't love your fellow man whom you have seen, you cannot love God whom you've not seen. You can't do it. Well, how come you didn't take your Arizona Republic then? <laughs> 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 I don't want to start any trouble, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't love those guys. <laughs> I don't know a single one of them, and by the way, I have no interest in knowing any of them. <laughs> if they move in next door to me, I want to know. <laughs> or if they sit... On a jury with me, I want to know. I, want to I can sit there in silence. <laughs> so this, the focus of our heart is going to be revealed in part by that which we give the most attention and have the greatest concern for. Um, and so, uh, oh, and by the way, that is not a license to be slothful about this life, you know. I mean, I think it's important we brush our teeth. And I'm not just saying that because we have a dentist here with us, okay? <laughs> Plus. Because uh, it's good not only for ourselves, but it's also good for our fellow man. Deodorant, deodorant's a good idea, okay? Deodorant's a good thing to have. And, you know, those who want to romanticize the hippies and all that, they never hang around them. I lived in Telluride when hippies started coming into Telluride. You didn't want to get within about 15 feet of that. And, um, and so slothfulness is not... Uh, what, what? <laughs> Kelly had his own conversation. <laughs> Just like the teacher, man. You got oh, okay. Yeah. You said you're on a roll. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, All right. The point is that sluggards or those who are slothful cannot have a relationship with God. You need to understand that. Only people who are diligent can have a relationship with God. Because it's only people who are diligent who will deal with the things that get exposed from their heart. And if you're slothful, you're like, oh, well, you know. And I, and I love uh, Foxworthy, you know, with you might be a redneck if, you know. You mow your yard and you find a car. <laughs> We've come to uh, learn, in, because of our business requiring that we get into people's personal space in their homes, um, we have learned uh, that um, what you see on the outside very frequently is indicative of what's here. Well, I'll deal with that unforgiveness some other time. I'll pay that debt I owe to somebody at another time. I, you know, put off all of these things, and it really is slothfulness. Diligence is required if you're going to walk with God because you've got to deal with trouble. And here is the trouble primarily with which we need to deal. So, where our treasure is. That's where our heart is going to be. So what is the priority and focus of our day? Is it actually to seek the Lord? And even if the mountain is quaking and shaking and giving off smoke, um, are you ready 
to stand against fear and to go. Because, you know, as you get near to God, you know what happens. Remember that from James 4? As we get near the Lord, the first thing we do is we realize our sinfulness and we cleanse our hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. And, and then we're broken about our disobedience and rebelliousness. We'll be miserable, mourn and weep, let your laughter be turned into mourning and joy to gloom. All of that's laid out there in, in James. And as, as we get nearer the Lord, that's, that's what's going to happen for us. And that's what's so important about us genuinely seeking Him. Not just hanging around people who want to talk about God, but people whose hearts are really set on God and desiring an encounter with Him. Let me tell you, every person, every person there's a record of that had an encounter with Jesus Christ was changed. Some were hardened. Okay? The Pharisees got more and more hardened and they immediately would go out and try to scheme together how they could kill Him. But most of the time, people's hearts were broken and, and became tender and they humbled themselves and their lives were changed and their relationships with other people were changed. So where is your treasure? Because that's going to be your focus as you head out each day. Don't just shove it over in the corner and it's another junk car with the weeds growing up over it. Um, let it be something that you're really going to deal with and you're going to clean that space out. So it goes on, he talks about the lamp of the body, and that's another subject for another time, but it really has to do with our, about our discernment and what we can see spiritually and what we can know spiritually. Turn over to, uh, well, let, um, let, let's, uh, yeah, let's go to, uh, to uh, chapter 12. Still in Matthew, chapter 12, Jesus is going to speak a little more about things related to the heart. At verse 33, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. And so the key about seeing what's in our heart is going to be what do we produce. There are some people that have a black cloud that follow them around. Uh, who was that? Pig pen on the yeah. Charlie Brown, wherever he went, you know? Um, I remember in Gulliver's Travels. Um, sorry to say I didn't get through the book, but I did watch the cartoons. And there was a character on the cartoons with the, watch that with my kids. We'll never make it. We're doomed. We'll never, I forget who that character was. No matter what was happening, we'll never make it. You see, what, what is the fruit emanating from you because you're having an impact on the people around you? What is in the vapor trail behind you? Hopefully, hopefully it's the, the fragrant aroma of the knowledge of Jesus. And not something that stinks. Okay. <laughs> Who's the cartoon guy you were just talking about? Oh, Charles Schultz and uh, Peanuts? Yeah. Well, Peanuts was sitting out in the desert. Charlie Brown? or uh, uh -huh. He was sitting out in the desert. And he said, Lord, he said, if you're up there, he said, send me a sign. And the next picture is a neon sign. <laughs> That's great. When Lynn and I were in college over in Phoenix, uh, Charles Schultz came and spoke to our chapel one day. Uh, you know, there's a book out there called The Gospel According to Peanuts. And uh, of course, as you know, Charles Schultz is a believer. And I don't know anything about his personal walk with God, but I know he impacted a lot of people and revealed some truth out there that's really. Um, I think it's been profitable for people through the years. So, he says uh, the tree is going to be known by its fruit. You can, you can say all you want, I'm born again, spirit filled. The proof is not going to be with your words. It's going to be the result of your conduct and your actions each day, which is going to reveal where your heart really is. You know, it might be that you're very devoted to, to church and people would look and say, oh my goodness, this is a real, uh, you know, person who's a real follower of Jesus. <laughs> and then you get to talking to them and it's, I remember this lady in Tennessee saying to, uh, to me one time, and we were trying to help her because she was in great conflict with her husband. We're trying to encourage her to get some peace in their relationship. And she's like, but, but I just love my church. I just love my church. 
And my husband won't go to my church, but I just love my church. <laughs> and I had to say to her, I said, ma'am, you need to be loving Jesus because if you love Jesus, He is concerned about your relationship with your husband, not a church organization. See, because that's about the heart. And a lot of people are devoted to their church and they feel good when they go there. But the fruit of their life says they're not a tree that is planted with the seed from Jesus because the seed from Jesus produces qualities, characteristics, and fruit that looks like Jesus. Fruit of the Spirit. Absolutely. Fruit of the Spirit is that capsuling of what that, that fruit looks like. So make the tree good and its fruit good, or bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. In verse 34, Jesus to this uh, crowd, and he's again contending with the uh, with the Pharisees because they had just accused him of casting demons out of people and setting people free from sickness, disease, and bondage by Satan's power. And so he says to them, "You bunch of snakes, you brood of vipers! How can you, being evil, speak?" what is good. Now don't miss this. For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. He said, now wait a minute, Rick. You just said a person may say, I'm born again, spirit filled. And their fruit proves that they're not. If the mouth speaks out of that which fills their heart. Well, what is that confession? I'm born again. I'm spirit filled. I'm saved, redeemed, heaven bound. You know, all of, you've heard that. You know, all of those cliches and those uh, those uh, statements that you'll hear people making. <clears throat> See what it's revealing is religious pride in your heart, saying with their mouth, "I'm born again, spirit filled." I'll tell you what. You just have to go with the Lord on this, but I'm really reluctant to tell anybody that. Because I don't find people in the Bible going around saying, I'm born again, spirit filled. You know, you born again, spirit filled? You say, redeemed? Because you don't find people in the Bible doing that. You see, the people that walked with Jesus were so humble that they only talked about, I'm walking with Jesus. And that, do I need to repeat the story again? My friend Randy have to know Randy. He's already gone on to be with Laura. Uh, Randy was with me in the car and we were doing 115 trying to get the lady to the hospital that night. <clears throat> Only in a few places because the roads were like this. Randy's mom heard that he had gone and confessed Jesus and been baptized and she called up. She was so excited. Randy, I'm so glad that you're saved, you're born again, you're a Christian. He goes, no, 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 Mom. Mom, stop. He said, I'm not one of those. He said, I'm just a guy who's trying to have a relationship with God. Amen. By the way, if you tell people that you're saved, you're born again, or spirit-filled, I'm not beating you up. I just, I just want you to think about it. Because sometimes we can say these things we think are uh, revealing one thing, but someone who's discerning actually realizes it's revealing something else. And sometimes it's religious arrogance and self-righteousness and pride. Because the people that walk with Jesus were, were pretty humble about it. Because I think they had seen the earthquake and the shaking mountain and they saw the lightning and they felt the impact of the thunder of the presence of God and it caused them to be very humble about their walk with God. So he says, the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. So the question you have to ask yourself is, as you're hearing your own conversation, what is your conversation? revealing about what's here. Too often I've had to go give me that back. <laughs> Oops. Oops. Did mean for that to slip up? <laughs> because I had more to hide of what was in here. Especially around church people. 
And be careful. It's real easy to offend church people. The only other people who get offended as easily as church people are ultra-liberal people. And then everything you say offends them. And they will circumcise you faster than the most devoted self-righteous person who was born and raised in a self-righteous uh, conservative uh, judgmental church that doesn't have anything to do with walking with Jesus. It has to do with walking with man. The mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Listen to what Jesus goes on and says in verse 35. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what is good. So, oh, there's nothing good about us. No, 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 no. You're misapplying the Scripture because we are to be holy as He is holy. That's not just in the so-called Old Testament books. That's right in the New Testament. Be holy for I'm holy. God's calling us to that. So what are the good things that come out of us? Things that make for peace. In fact, I didn't read it, but Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Peacemakers helping people to make peace in their relationship with God as well as making peace with their fellow man. So what good things can come out? We can bless those who curse us. We can do good to our enemies. And as I still picture Mark mentioned that last week, <laughs> piling the coals, right? Just sit right there and keep piling the coals on those people that hate you. You just keep blessing them and apologizing and, you know, and humbling yourself and the coals just keep pouring down. It's either going to burn them up or it's going to set up a fire and uh, help them to get out of the place they're in. The good man out of his good treasure brings forth what's good. The evil man out of his evil treasure brings forth what's evil. And then, of course, we had spent some time looking about words, but this is just a reminder here, for verse 36. But I say to you, every careless word that men shall speak, they'll render account for it in the day of judgment. Yes. For by your words you shall be justified, and by your words you shall be condemned. All right. Um, let's go on to uh, chapter 13. Chapter 13, verse 10. This is when Jesus uh, spoke to the largest crowd He ever spoke to. And no one understood what He said. His disciples were really amazed and perplexed as to why He spoke in parables. And they asked why in verse 10. And He said, To you it's been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been granted. So it almost sounds like the Lord didn't want people to understand. And that's not it at all if you read and get a picture of what's happened here. Um, for whoever has, he's talking about the seed of the word, to him shall more be given, he'll have an abundance. Whoever does not have even what he, and I think it's Mark who says, whoever think, whatever he thinks he has is going to be taken away from him. <clears throat> Verse 13, Therefore I speak to them in parables because while seeing, they don't see. And uh, that kind of connects back to the thing where if the lamp of the body, the lamp of the body is the eye, and if the eye is dull, uh, there's great darkness. And if the light that's in you is darkness, then how great is that darkness? And it's talking about our discernment and understanding. Same thing here. Seeing you don't see, hearing you don't hear, nor do they understand. And in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you'll keep on hearing, but not understand. You'll keep on seeing, but will not perceive. And verse 15 reveals the issue. Here it is. The heart of this people has become dull. The hearts become dull. So the whole issue out of this crowd was about their hearts. Because I've mentioned to you numerous times, from all indications of the three Gospels that record this, not one person understood what Jesus was saying. And the reason they didn't understand was the heart. Their hearts were dull. Now, now these were these were people who claimed to walk with God. These were people you would have found the majority of them would have been very faithful in religious services. They would have been tithing. They would have been uh, fasting, giving alms, all of those kinds of things. And yet, their hearts have become dull. And because of the dullness of their heart, it was not granted for them to understand the things that Jesus was teaching. 
So God does, doesn't throw His Word and his, the mysteries of His Word out just willy-nilly everywhere. He gives it to those whose hearts are turned toward Him. But again, I, it's really important before we press on from this that you remember that even though no one understood what He said, there was a division in the people that were in the audience that day. There was a small contingent of people who knew they didn't understand what Jesus said. The majority went away thinking they understood what Jesus said. And that's where I got into the thing that I believe some of the people went away thinking Jesus was teaching waste not, want not, and cleanliness is next to godliness. Neither of those principles are a bad thing in and of themselves, but they have absolutely no bearing on what Jesus is talking about here. Because Jesus is talking about heart's condition and the seed of God's Word needing to penetrate into the heart and be moistened by the Holy Spirit so that our lives can be transformed and brought into the image of Jesus. It has nothing to do with your physical maintenance of your own body and things around you. And yet some people, that's all they got out of it. Because their heart was dull. Verse 14 again. Or excuse me, 15. The heart of this people has become dull. With their ears, they scarcely hear. And I believe the key is in the middle of this verse, this next phrase. They have closed their eyes. I have to tell you, for a long period of time in my relationship with God, my eyes were closed. Consequently, my heart was very dull. And you could tell it by looking at the vapor trail of destruction that I left behind me in my relationships with people and with my family. That proved my heart was dull. How did I get to a place that I would close my eyes? Because I was right in what I believe the Bible was teaching. And I would set out with anyone and argue with anyone to prove that my views were right. That's when you close your eyes. You draw a circle around what you know. And you say, God, anything you want to do as long as it's in the circle. <laughs> Be fine. And God says, but that circle's so small, Rick. That you can just live your life in that circle and you don't need anything from me. That's what I did. I had closed my eyes because I had the right theology and I had the right truth. Let me tell you, these people were in that same posture and their church had trained them to be that way. That's why, oh no, you don't, you don't go visit one of those churches over there, something might jump on you. <laughs> you know? Besides, you, you might find some bread that tastes pretty good over there. And we want you to keep enjoying our stale, petrified bread that we feed here. Because we're right! In our little circle. And everywhere we go, we take our little circle with us. Right here. And then we once in a while will peer over the parapet wall and look. Yep, they're still being wicked and ungodly in those other churches. Oh, we're gonna stay right here. <laughs> they had closed their eyes. So so why did they travel the distance they did to hear Jesus speak if they already Most of the time, I would go to listen to other speakers to find more proof that it's hard to walk with God when you got this little tiny circle, but you can get it done. See, folks, I really believe that's what religion has done to people all across America. And I encounter people regularly that have no interest why the hell would you go on a Tuesday night and spend two hours in Bible study? Someone would like to ask you that, but that, they'd be careful that would fit into here so they wouldn't say it that way. But that's really what they're thinking. 
Just like the ladies that ran one church that I was speaking at that said, you can't have Bible study for five hours on Saturday. And I went, really? Why? And they were kind of surprised to ask why. They said, nobody would come. They will be so boring. Well, see, if you live right here, that gets pretty stinking boring. But if your heart is open and you're hungry for the truth of God, it is thrilling and exciting. And you overturn a rock and here's a whole new truth that's going to transform your life. It feeds your soul and your spirit. But don't people tenaciously hold on to the petrified bread? That lump that you get served because you stay in that circle. Isn't it tragic? These people heard the voice of the very Son of God. And all they got was waste not, want not, and cleanliness is next to God. And it just reinforced. That's what they were looking for. But the other people knew that they didn't understand what it meant. Because they knew it was far more than some little external things that you could go and do. They knew it had to do with the heart, but they didn't understand what it was. And so they came and said, Jesus, explain this to us. The disciples knew that they didn't understand. The other people were sure that they did understand. And so they have closed their eyes and until they repent and humble themselves and acknowledge that they don't have it all figured out, then God has nothing more to say to them. They close their eyes lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ear, understand with their heart and return. That is, repent, turn to God and begin to seek His face. Oh, and by the way, the consequence of returning and 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 repenting and turning to God is, and I should heal. Now, and I think that's in every way. I think that's spiritual healing. I think that is physical healing. I, I think all of those things that God has in store for those who really are seeking Him. But Jesus contrasts the crowd that went away with the disciples and blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. But they said, well, wait a minute, we don't understand. Yeah, that's because they were hearing. They knew that they didn't understand. When in self-righteousness, they thought they already had the truth and their hearts had become dull, then they don't see with their eyes. The ones who do see, see that they don't understand what Jesus was saying. So when you read it and say, ah, oh, so frustrating reading the Bible because I don't understand what it means, that is a good sign. So then you keep going to the Lord, asking Him, show me what this means. Keep coming back to it. That should be encouraging to all of us. By the way, sometimes you want to learn about a particular subject or a particular passage, and you're like, God, I don't know what that means. And you know why? He's not giving you the answers because there's something else, another subject matter that's more of a priority in your relationship with God. And he says, leave that alone. Come over here where I'm feeding you. I remember for a period of time, every time I went to study something, I came back to nine to the flesh. And ultimately that led to this understanding about spiritual adultery. But I kept saying, oh, I want to study this. But God, I don't know what this means. And God gives me nothing, gives me nothing, and boom. Dying to the flesh. Dying to the flesh. Dying to the flesh. Dying to the flesh. Oh, you want me to study about dying to the flesh? Hello? You're finally getting the message? Sometimes we can't just say, this is what I'm going to study. The Lord is trying to show us something else. By the way, that's part of the reason I don't go to Revelation about prophecy about end times. Because you know what? I don't think God's giving anybody anything about that. That's just my opinion right now. Because all the stuff I'm hearing now is the same crap that I've been hearing for 35 years and it's never proved out to be so. So let's study about what God wants us to know about. About how we get along with each other. He's talking to us about that. About what holiness is. And about how to get the hardness out of our hearts. So that we can hear His voice and it can draw us into the image of Jesus. 
Verse 17, Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and they didn't see it. And to hear what you hear. Matthew 15, verse 7. Once again, Jesus gave an illustration of how their religious tradition actually was contradictory to the Word of God. And He says in verse 7, You hypocrites, you pretenders, you play actors. Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you saying, This people honors Me with their lips, but their heart is far away from Me. Once again, I believe that you see a contradiction between what they say and the fruit of their lives, so it proves what's coming out of their mouth is not genuine. It's pretentious. Maybe it's been ingrained in them or they've been trained to say that. Or, you know, they've, they've learned some of these uh, isms and sayings that churches say. And so you repeat those in you know, a given setting, but the heart is, is not really behind what's being spoken. In vain do they worship me. I want you to notice these are people who would go to worship. But he said it's in vain that they worship me. And the essence of the problem is they were teaching as though it was the Word of God or the doctrines of God, the precepts of men. One of the things that we've begun to see, I hope you're beginning to get the picture, is a key ingredient in seeking God with the whole heart is remaining in His Word and taking His Word into your heart. When I meet people that are not interested in the Word of God, and I, and I encounter people like that. Staff members, leaders in churches, devoted people that go to every kind of meeting that the church has. And if you want to talk about something in Scripture, they have no interest. Because their heart's hard. They live in that little circle. But you see, the servants of Jesus are hungry for more truth from Him. And they realize that they haven't got it all figured out, that there's more to know. And that we can come in a closer walk with God to really experience the full power of His kingdom right here, right now, in this place. So he said, it's vain that you worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. And after He called the multitude, He said to them, Hear and understand. Verse 11, not what enters the mouth defiles the man. Tell that, tell that to religious leaders all across America. <laughs> oh, except, oh, excuse me, except, except, except the things that we said not to put in your mouth. Oh, oh sorry, I guess Jesus didn't know what he was talking about. I mean, he's just God. What would he know? These religious leaders, we know a whole lot more about it. Don't put that on your mouth. Don't take this in. Not what enters the mouth defiles the man, but what proceeds out of the mouth, this defiles the man. I love verse 12. I know that I probably make some of you cringe once in a while. Maybe tonight. But get a load of verse 12. The disciples came and said to him, to Jesus, uh, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when you said this? Good. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It is. <laughs> they got their feelings hurt because they're always don't have it. Put, put, put that down. Put that cookie away. Don't do that. <laughs> See, that's what that's what religion does. Those things don't affect the heart, and that's what Jesus was saying. It's what comes out that defiles a man because it reveals what's in the heart. And Jesus, by the way, when they said the religious leaders, they're offended. Jesus said, every plant that my heavenly Father didn't plant will be rooted up. Let them alone. They're blind guides of the blind. And if a blind man guides a blind man, you remember, they both fall in the pit. And then, of course, meek, mild, quiet, wallflower Peter blurts out, <laughs> as always, explain to us the parable. <laughs> he was just saying what everybody else was thinking. <laughs> and Jesus goes and he 
He says, are you still lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand some simple biology and human anatomy? Everything that goes in the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated. That's why we have the porta potties out here when the crowds gather, right? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. And those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, slanderers. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with so-called unwashed hands does not defile the man. Did you just kind of settle the, some religious controversies here? I mean, is that pretty straightforward? I think it is. Let's look at one more passage. Matthew 19, verse 3, And some Pharisees came to him, testing him, saying, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause at all? And if uh, those of you that know a little bit about the history, in this time in which Jesus came to the world physically, that if a man was annoyed because his wife wasn't fixing the food he wanted, he could write her a certificate of divorcement. Boom, done. That's how easy it was. Is it uh, lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any cause? And he said, have you not read that he created them in the beginning, male and female? And he said, for this cause a man leaves his father and mother and cleaves his wife, and the two shall become one. Consequently, they're no longer two but one flesh. What therefore God is joined together, let no man separate and they said, well, then why did Moses command to give her a certificate and divorce her? And Jesus answers that question. Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it has not been this way. So Jesus is saying this uh, a divorce was not an option in God's design in human relationships. Okay? It wasn't an option. He didn't want that to be the option. But human beings have a problem. From his youth, his thoughts and his conduct is only evil continually. And so, what he said is, here's, here's the problem. The problem is, for those of you who have gone through the gut-wrenching, heartbreaking, destructive experience of a divorce. The problem is your heart gets hardened through that. And by the way, that's not incurable. Okay? It's not a permanent hardening of the heart. It's a warning that when you've gone through that kind of a tearing of your soul, <clears throat> the problem results in a hardening of the heart. And Jesus is saying, you need to be on guard. God didn't want you to have to deal with that kind of hardness of heart. But it's the reality of relationships. I was telling somebody just earlier this evening. You know, it takes two to make a marriage work. It only takes one to make it fail. It only takes one. So if you've gone through that, you have an extra measure of challenge in your heart than those of us who were blessed that we worked through the issues and have, had to have that separation and that tear. And that is, you have an extra measure to deal with of grace and forgiveness and mercy so that your heart does not become hard. I haven't had hard enough time. Uh, there's my wife back there. 43 years to not have a hardened heart. Okay? And, and vice versa. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't a one-sided problem. It's a two-sided problem. It's two-way street. But for those of you who have had that heartache, may the, the grace and the mercy of God be given to you in an extra measure so that your heart can become tender again. Someone was telling me today, I... He said, I've made peace with my, with my ex-wife. He said, that there's not any hope of us ever getting back together. That's not, that's not the, the thought. But I said, it's wonderful. When people have been through that kind of a ripping apart of your soul, that you can, you can be at peace. 
one of the fellows who was in our church in Colorado used to tell me I get along just famously with with my ex-wife you now, and uh, and and my new wife does too. He said, "Gosh, if we'd have gotten along like this, we probably wouldn't have gotten divorced." But but he said it was that ripping and that tearing, and then the the healing of the heart and the new beginning, and now God's restored the relationship and, and they get along famously. And that's that's what God desires: is that our hearts not become hard. So we have to be on guard with an extra measure if you've gone through that. I think there are other crises and difficulties in life that people can encounter that likewise require that you be on guard with. Yes, ma'am? I think people have a tendency not to have a lot of compassion for people. Mm -hmm. that have been divorced. You know? Well, especially religious people. Yeah. Yeah. They don't take on my husband and I, we just murder is not a bad idea, but never born. <laughs> it was considered several times all around. <laughs> all around the house. The board was never an option. Well, um, being uh, uh, the age that I am now, having had a numerous experiences in life. Um, there are a lot of things that can cause the heart to become hardened. And sometimes the only way we can get free of that is just to let the Lord wash it out. And uh, I've told you the story, I'll mention it again, the big tough guy was telling us in Colorado, why is it, you know, every time I come into the meetings, I just sit there and I weep. And I said, brother, just receive it. God is washing hardness out of your heart. You know, you girls who were molested by, you know, family members. Oh my goodness. I would think that that probably is every bit as destructive, if not more so, the ripping apart of the divorce as far as hardening the heart. You know, how, do you, how do you ever trust the Lord. The Lord. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's into that. But, but the Lord is in the heart business. And sometimes we just need to let that wash over us. So sometimes in our meetings, it washes over me. And, and I tend to react rather quickly. Uh, I guess it's the feminine side of me coming out. <laughs> that part that wasn't hardened. <laughs> by my brother being murdered and by this happening and you know, all these different things that have happened along the way. But sometimes I just need that to wash heart and sound. So don't fight it. That's a good thing. Washing water with the Word and the Spirit of God so that there can be tenderness to receive the seed. Thank you, Lord, tonight for Your Word. And thank You for the Spirit taking this Word and piercing into our hearts.